uh, piece, like what is your why? You know, you look at Simon Sinek, talks about it a lot. You know, I think Rotary speaks to my why. And if it's not part of your why, then all in fairness, probably you shouldn't be a member. But if it does speak to your why, I think at your core, then you deserve it to yourself and your community. It's going to make you a better person. You're going to be better for helping the community out. So why not continue to be a member, but also it's service before self. I've watched over the years, right? People that think, you know, I'm going to get rich off of rotary connections or networking. This is not the opportunity for that. This is to kind of roll up your sleeves and show your worth uh, if you really want to make the community better. So, yeah, I think for me, my better friendships have come through Rotary. Uh, my better opportunities to both advance my organization or myself have come because I've made deposits and we've made the community better. And I think that's, you know, at the end of the day, right, uh, we all will push up daisies the exact same way. But what do you want to be known for and what do you want your legacy to be? Welcome to the Rotary Club of Milwaukee. I am club president, Darren Miller, president and owner of JM Construction. As we gather virtually today, we will begin our program as always with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now we have Karen Hung, founder and CEO of Silver Rock Consulting, who will be giving our invocation today. Karen. Great, thank you, Pastor Darren. For today's invocation, I thought about our speaker, John Burke and Trek Bicycles. Trek's tagline of ride bikes, have fun, feel good, seemed to reflect the value of freedom, an underlining aspect of our nation and a very important part of our day-to-day -day lives. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for our freedom, which is not free and ultimately comes from you. Thank you for the citizens and leaders who live responsibly so we can collectively appreciate and enjoy our freedoms. For our military who globally defends our freedom and have done so over centuries. For the wisdom and principles like freedom of speech established by our nation's founders. Thank you for the freedom to thrive, to grow, to learn, which is part of what we're doing today and what Rotary stands for. We ask that you continue to protect our freedoms and let us not take them for granted. Amen. Thank you, Karen. We also wanna say thank you to Wendell Willis for his contribution to our Rotary Now More Than Ever video series that played before our program. If you missed it, it will play again when we adjourn. Wendell was recently featured in the Milwaukee Business Journal for his work supporting local students as executive director of the MPS Foundation. Hats off to you and all of your hard work, Wendell. We now have a new member to introduce today, Mary Sprague, board president of the Milwaukee Public Library Foundation. We'll introduce new Rotarian Amelia Cagle. Uh, when we first moved to Milwaukee from New York City in 1994, as we were driving from the airport, I saw these big billboards with a guy with curly hair and it said, buy a bike, buy a bike, buy a bike. And I thought, well, that's very clever advertising. Little did it, I know, it turned out to be Chris Cagle who owned Wheel and Sprocket. And in 1996, we met Amelia Cagle, his um, daughter. And she quickly became my daughter's very best friend. So Amelia's first job at Wheel and Sprocket was in the advertising. She would be uh, in the TV commercials and she was quite humorous, <laughs> I think. Um, and now, she is officially the vice president of Wheel and Sprocket and heads their events and advocacy departments. And together with her brother, Noel, they are second generation Milwaukee business owners looking to make a positive impact on communities through biking. 
and I'm going to read a quote from Amelia. Bikes are part of our DNA. Growing up, most of our family vacations were bike vacations. These trips escalated by the time we were ready to go to college. Our dad made a pact that he would pay for university if we rode our bikes there. So Noel went to McGill in Montreal. So every year they'd pack up their driveway in Mequon and ride to Quebec. I, I was, you know, I was always amazed by that because with my daughter, we were in the car with the trailer with a thousand things that she needed at college. <laughs> Amelia went to school at the University of British Columbia, but they cheated and started in Alberta to ride to Vancouver. Today, all four Kegel kids live in Milwaukee and work for family businesses. Noel, Amelia, and Tessa are with Wheel and Sprocket, and their brother Julian and his wife Stephanie run Kegels Inn. They have the best fish fry and duck you will ever have in Milwaukee. So I encourage you to support their business as well. Amelia is very excited about her brand new store opening in Bayview. She invites you to come and look. It was a three-year renovation. I saw it in its original state, and I'm anxious to go back and see its renovation in person when that all that can happen. Um, so Amelia, thank you for becoming a Rotarian. And I really look forward to working with you on many projects. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I can call you Mary after years and years and years of Mrs. Greg. So I finally <laughs> figured that out. Right. Um, but it's really, it's a pleasure to be a part of Rotary. I think that uh, what makes Milwaukee really special is we just have an amazing community that builds each other up. So I think in other cities, people can bring each other down, but not in this city. Like everyone is working together and it's very, very special. Um, but hello, everyone. Uh, for my first meeting, I'm going to introduce people, which seems a little uh, intimidating, but here I am. Uh, my name is Amelia Kegel. I'm the vice president of Wheel and Sprocket. And today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Richie Burke, who is the founder of Go, Get it, Go Getters podcast. Who will be Amelia? Oh, we have a bit me? more club business. Uh, oh, Friday never days. mind. I'm not doing that yet, you guys. Just kidding. Thanks for jumping right in. I appreciate the, the early intro and the enthusiasm. We'll do it again. Yeah, we'll All do right. it again soon. Sounds good. Sounds good. Leaning in, Amelia. You're doing great. <laughs> That's great. It's great to have you. Uh, welcome to Rotary, Amelia. Look forward to being able to connect uh, again in person, hopefully soon. Uh, just a quick little run through on uh, a bit of more club, club business here. Um, next, we have Tom Sattler, Senior Vice President with the Equitable Bank and Chair of the Dun a Day Committee who has an announcement about this Friday's volunteer event. Tom? Thanks, President Aaron. Uh, this Friday from 1 until 3.30, Rotarians are invited to help our friends at Feeding America with sorting, packing, and labeling food to be distributed to those who face hunger. We were there in November, and I can assure you that CDC guidelines are being adhered to there. This is a fun and rewarding way for us to be of service to our partners at Feeding America and also a great way of reconnecting or meeting fellow Rotarians. Please email Michelle at the office to register. Look forward to seeing you there on Friday. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate the announcement. Look forward to seeing everybody at that event. Uh, next, our annual RCM scholarship golf outing is only a few months away. This year's event will take place on Monday, June 7th at the Wisconsin Country Club. Enjoy a day of golf and reception to socialize with colleagues and fellow Rotarians while supporting our scholars, many of whom are the first in their family to attend college. Registration is now open for golf and the cocktail reception. See the link in this morning's email to register. We're also looking for great items to add to the voice and silent auctions, so contact the Rotary office if you'd like to donate something. And I would be remiss uh, not to mention it'd be great to have a Trek bike slid into that auction. Thank you also to all of those who joined us last Thursday uh, for our first of our monthly virtual happy hours. 
It was nice to connect with fellow Rotarians in casual conversation over cocktails. Our next virtual happy hour is going to occur on April, April 1st. This Thursday, our noon snack program is back with Ron Smith, editor of the Milwaukee Neighborhood News Service, who will share his insights covering Milwaukee's local news. The March Coffee Connector is scheduled for this Thursday morning, March 11th at 7.30 a.m. Contact Teresa Regan or the Rotary Office for the Zoom information for that meeting. While we can't wait to get back to meeting in person in the interim, we also have our Rotary Connections. Sign up each month to be randomly paired with another Rotary member. It will then be up to the individuals to share a virtual or socially distanced meetup or meetups throughout the month. Contact Michelle in the Rotary office to be paired up for March, uh, for this March uh, pairing connections. One more final announcement. Uh, last week, we had a moment of silence for the passing of fellow Rotarian Warren Crunin. His family had designated our scholarship program as the recipient of his memorial donations. So far, $6,500 in donations have been sent to us. Thank you to all of you for your generosity. And now, Amelia Kegel, Vice President of Wheel and Sprocket will come on to introduce our program for today. Amelia. Thank you, Darren. Yeah, I'm uh, very easily excitable over here. But um, hello, <laughs> and let's try this again. But today I really do have the pleasure of introducing Richie Burke, uh, founder of Go Getters Podcast, who will be introducing John Burke, uh, president of Trek Bicycle. And yeah, they're related. Um, I've known the Burks my entire life. You know, Wheel and Sprocket started in 1973 in a small suburb in Milwaukee, and Trek Bicycles started in 1975 in a red barn outside of Madison. And throughout the years, our two companies have and families have grown together, learned from each other, and really blossomed. Uh, John's father and Richie's grandfather, Dick Burke, was a mentor and a business confidant to my father, Chris Kegel. And throughout the years, I'm really happy to say that John has become the same to me and my siblings. There's something really special about having great relationships like this across uh, and between our industry lines. And I'm forever grateful for the excellent advice that John's given me throughout the years and that I continue to receive. Uh, today, we're gonna hear an awesome story about Trek, one of Wisconsin's most successful companies and how they've navigated through this really challenging year in the pandemic. So without further ado, I'd like to share my screen and all the screens uh, with Richie and John Burke. All right, Amelia, thanks for the, the introduction. Welcome to the club, excited to, to have you in. And yeah, it's great to see all that you and Noel do for the community through Wheelan, Wheelan Sprocket and how you've led the business over the last few years. So excited to, to have you on. Um, just to add on a little bit to Amelia's intro, some of you may know um, my dad. He spoke at Rotary a few years ago when he came out with his presidential playbook book. A um, couple other fun facts. He's, he's an amazing father figure. May have gotten into my notes. He was the, um, the RFK 2019 golf scramble champion. Not sure how he ended up winning that event. <laughs> um, he's a two-time Ironman finisher. May not know that, but finished two Ironmans. And obviously the president of Trek Bicycle. I'm a little nervous. I've never interviewed JB live before. And I just heard Mary told me um, my grandma, his mother, Elaine Burke, may be on, who's a wonderful grandmother. Um, so better bring our A game here today. Also, from a housekeeping perspective, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the, in the comments box. I'll be monitoring that. I probably have to have dinner with JV later. We're both out in California, so I'll be throwing some softballs. If you have any hard-hitting questions, drop them below. And also, whenever, whenever we do something like this or I go to a Trek event, usually get about uh, 15 people who feel the need to tell me that I look and sound exactly like my dad, which is true, and it's, it's very flattering when I hear those comments. Mary already said that. Amelia alluded to it. Um, and if you feel the urge to do that, too, feel free to drop that in the comments. But please, if you want to get it out of your system in the first few minutes, it'll be easier for me to monitor the comments as we go along. So thanks again for having me. Oh, Captain Reeve already chimed in. Your dad is much better looking. Thank you, Jamie Reeve. Wow, that is nice. Okay. Um, all right, JB, let's get started. So 
For those who don't know, can you give a high level overview of the history of Trek and how you got involved in the business? Well, Richie, thanks for having me. And Amelia, thanks for the great introduction. It's great to see you. And congratulations on becoming a Rotarian. You will be an amazing member. Um, you know, Trek started in uh, 1976. Um, my father owned a business in Milwaukee. He was in the appliance distribution business. And he ran into a guy who uh, wanted to start a bike company, Bevel Hog. And so uh, my father was the uh, money behind it and Bevel was the bike guy. And uh, they located in Waterloo, which was in between uh, Madison and Milwaukee. And that's how uh, Trek started um, in 1976. I think they made something about 500 and 70 bikes in the first year and they grew the business uh, from there. And uh, I ended up joining the company in 1984 when it had reached its peak. Um, the business was um, doing quite well and I started in May of 1984. And at that time the business crashed, um, just kind of went um, down customer service issues, quality issues, et cetera. And I spent a bunch of time out in the field watching that happen. And it was a great education for me. And uh, that's how I got involved in the business. And it's the only job I've ever had. And what's it been like going through the pandemic the last year and what, what are the focuses right now? Yeah, it's been the crazy. I've been at Trek for 37 years and it's been the craziest year um, ever times 10. And, uh, you know, I just remember being in my office on uh, March 12th and watching, watching the U.S. shut down, watching Europe shut down and, uh, you know, putting the team together. And we were thinking this was going to be the worst year in Trek's history. And, you know, we had a great meeting, got everybody together figured out what our priorities uh, needed to be. And we listed out six priorities. Um, we did some financial modeling for Trek's worst year and what all the uh, ramifications of that were gonna be. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we communicated. One of the six things we said we were gonna do is we were gonna communicate. And, you know, I did, a, video update with the Trek team once a week, let everybody know what was going on. Um, and we put a lot of plays into place to make sure that uh, Trek was gonna do just fine. And, you know, I told our people at the time from that first video on March 12th, I said, when it was apparent what an impact the pandemic would have, I told them, I said, this will be our finest hour. I go, we will, we will do our best work here. And it looked like it was going to be brutal. And then about the end of March, somebody walked into my office and they said, you know, I was on a, I was on the phone with the dealer in Florida and he had a line outside his door. I'm like, no. And uh, that was the start of it. And then there was a weekend about April 12th and the lines were out the door and in Florida, they were out the door in Milwaukee, they were out the door everywhere and the bike boom started. We have an official start date. It was April 12th and Europe was still locked down but Europe came back in May and the bike boom was in full swing. And by the end of May, we have large distribution centers in the United States and by the end of May, they were empty. Um, what we thought on March 12th was going to be an absolute disaster. By the end of May, it was um, clearly going to be the biggest year in Trek history. And so since then, we've gone from, um, you know, focusing on our business to our number one priority, just being our supply chain is making sure that we build enough product, that we get enough product and, um, it's been an absolute challenge. So that's the, that's the pandemic. And JB, obviously you guys have been one of the industries that have benefited from COVID. You, met, you mentioned supply chain. What are some of the other issues that it's uh, 
brung about and as a global company with a lot of people headquartered in Waterloo, what's it been like adjusting to working remotely? Well, you know, the first thing I would say is, you know, I think one of the, one of the things we did early on is we have a retail group and we made a decision to keep stores open and we made a decision to keep stores open while a lot of other people were shutting stores down. And, you know, bikes were deemed essential because they're used as transportation in a lot of areas. And we said we were going to keep stores open, but we were going to do it really safe. And within three days of the pandemic, we had our retail group came out with a great process on how we were going to be able to keep people on their bikes and do it in a very safe manner. And I remember going out to our store in Madison and, and seeing people run the play and then going to a Whole Foods. <laughs> I was like, the Trek stores were 10 times safer than Whole Foods was. And I was just super proud of the group. And we were able to take all that information and share it with all of our retailers to, we, to the wheel and sprockets of the world, to everybody else and say, this is how you can run a, a safe business in the pandemic. And you know, we've, we've had an amazing, um, an amazing effort put in by our retailers around the world. We have about 5,000 um, retailers around the world. And these have been frontline workers who have put in, you know, 80, 100 hour weeks, keeping up with the bike boom, fixing bikes, assembling bikes, going through this. The people at Trek in the warehouses, um, manufacturing, you know, we've, we've put in a big effort. So those have been the biggest parts of this, but, you know, a really big part has been dealing with the supply chain and trying to get parts, trying to get increases in production. That's been, you know, a huge focus here at the same time. And can you touch on Trex advocacy strategy and why that's so important to you. You guys do a lot for cycling in general, not just for the company. You also do a lot with social equity and sustainability at this point. Yeah, I think I, I hear my mother is on the line and uh, it's my biggest fan club, one member. And, <laughs> you know, this, this goes, this is a, uh, you know, the, one of the things I'm most proud about at Trek is, is not how many bikes we sell or, or what the profit is at the end of the year. It's, it's how we run the company. And, and that comes from the values that my parents had. And that comes from the values that they passed on. And those values were passed on to their kids. Those values um, have been passed on to Trek. And one of the things we always try and do at Trek is we try and use the bike company to do great things. And in cycling, what that means is we get involved to create more and safer places to ride your bike because we think that cycling can change the world. We think that there's a health crisis in America and a lot of other parts of the world. And we think people can get out on their bikes more often. We think there's an environmental crisis that's only going to get worse. And we think if people are riding their bikes, that helps the earth. Um, and we think there's, you know, a big issue with congestion and anybody who's on a bike is not in a car and that helps people who have to be in their cars. So we put a big effort into advocacy throughout the United States. Um, and there's more and more going on to create, um, bike trails. And, you know, Amelia is on the line here and one of the all time great advocates, was her father, Chris. And I don't mean just in Milwaukee. I mean, around the United States, I would spend a lot of time with Chris in Washington, DC, bending people's ears. And Chris made a huge difference in Milwaukee and around the country. And I think that's really good. But you know, we, you know, we do more. And you know, one of my best stories is my mother was an early environmentalist, and we would save all of our papers. And we would save all of our cans and we'd put them in the basement. And then once a month, we'd fill up the Vista Cruiser, which got like three and a half miles to the gallon. And my mother would drive 20 miles to uh, drop off the paper in the cans. Yeah. And, uh, 
You know, one of the things I'm really proud of at Trek right now are just our sustainability efforts. We're going to be coming out with a sustainability report, I think, near the end of uh, end of May, early June, and it goes through, you know, what Trek has been doing on the sustainability side. And I had a conversation with Rory Kennedy about a year and a half ago, and she was telling me about this documentary that she had made about her uncle, President Kennedy, and and NASA. And she went to do this documentary and she found out upon interviewing everybody at NASA that NASA actually knows more about the earth than anybody else. They're not just about space, space. they study the earth. And so I watched the documentary and I was just blown away. And uh, Rory told me, she goes, the people really in the know, they say we have 10 years. And I went back to Trek and I said, we're gonna, we're gonna do something about this. We're gonna add this as one of our top objectives and we're gonna be a leader in climate change and we're gonna do it fast. And we've been making um, a lot of progress and it's, it's an area I'm really um, interested in and we're doing some great work there. And the, the one other one I just wanna talk about is just um, social equity. And after the George Floyd murder last year, um, a lot of companies did a lot of different things and we thought about it. And then I have two huge whiteboards in my office and I got a good team of people in and I said, what could we really do? Besides sending out a press release or cutting a check, what, what could Trek really do? And, and the bike business is a white man's business. It's from a business standpoint and from a participation standpoint. And we we had some 50 different ideas and we whittled it down to six, but we're opening up stores in areas and cities where there are no bike shops. Um, we are launching training programs. There's a shortage of mechanics and managers and bicycle retail where um, for people of color who haven't had chances, we're doing training. We've got six specific programs, um, including we spend a lot of money sponsoring kids mountain biking. There's a group called NICA and we have this amazing um, program out there and we'll do over 250 scholarships a year to get underprivileged kids into an opportunity to get outside, to own their own bike, have their own equipment and do that. And that is the tip of the iceberg of what Trek does. But and this comes from my mother, it also comes from my father, just using the company to do things in the community. And you, you consider Trek not just a bicycle company, but a hospitality company, and in, in some ways a hospitality company first. Can you talk about that? You know, that goes back to when I started at Trek. I was, I was a sales rep out on the road and, and our hospitality score was zero. And, you know, I would go to customers and I'd been there two weeks ago and they still hadn't gotten their order. I'd taken care of their warranty in the process where pro the credits hadn't been processed. And it was a nightmare. And I said, man, if I ever get into a position of power around there, um, we're going to change that. And sure enough, Trek fell on some really hard times and my father fired the managers and he came in and he ran the business. And I was 23 and he brought me in to run customer service and we, uh, we got it rolling. And, you know, and that's one of the things I learned from him is you put the customer first and we are all about hospitality. We just take care of people. Um, hospitality is part of our mission statement. Um, you know, I, we had this uh, owner's manual and I hate it. It's written by the lawyers and it's terrible. And it was about 10 years ago and they come in and they tell me, we're gonna rewrite the owner's manual. And I say, thank God. And I go, would you just make it so it's for consumers and it's not for lawyers? And they said they were gonna do that. And they came back and they told me all the reasons why it had to be for the lawyers. And I was fairly disgusted. And I said, well, give me this. I want the first two pages. And they said, okay, so I wrote a note. And I said, uh, dear customer, thank you for buying a track. Welcome to the track family. If you ever have any problem, please contact your Trek retailer and they'll take care of you. If they don't, call Trek 
at this number and they'll take care of you. And if they don't take care of you, here's my email and I will. And I can always tell you the start of the bike season because that's when I start to get more and more emails, but we have a commitment throughout the organization that the customer's first and we do whatever it takes to take care of the customer. What gave you that idea? Because I've seen you answering those emails or, or even calling those people. And it's, it's kind of funny. They're always shocked to hear. <laughs> hear well, from you know, what, do you, what do you fire off? Like five to 10 a week, maybe? Oh, no. no I, in the, in the, well, yeah, I'd say five to 10 a week in the slow, in the off season. And then when the in season comes in, it's, you know, it's maybe five to 10 a day. But you know, I just get a kick out of getting an, an, an email from an irate uh, customer. And I'm an email junkie, so I look at my emails regularly through the day. And so if one pops up, I just answer it right away. And they're like, I you know, they, I always like the ones that start out with, I know you'll never read this, but. <laughs> and so I always, I always respond to those and, uh, you know, I also like calling up the customers on the phone. I get a, I get a little bit of a charge out of that. And uh, I, I like taking care of the customers. It sets the tone throughout the entire organization. And uh, we get the customer's problem solved. How much, how much more value do you think you're able to add as the president of the company that you're actually calling those customers and that you are an avid cyclist opposed to someone just in the C-suite, which... I'm guessing what you're doing is is rare compared to a lot of larger organizations actually picking up the phone and responding to those emails. Well, you know, it's uh, it's something I love to do. I mean, I learn more from the customers than they learn from me. And it's a good chance for me to keep my hand on the pulse of what what customers are actually thinking. And it also, you know, when a customer is reaching out to me, they have a problem. And we obviously didn't live up to what our commitment was. So out of that customer experience will come, you know, for me, it's getting people on the phone or sending emails and it's, it's getting to the root cause of the problem. And through one customer, you can solve a potential customer for 50,000 or a hundred thousand other customers. So I always view it as they're doing, they're doing Trek a favor. Mm -hmm. And one of, you, one of your big goals is to make Trek a hundred year old company, which would extend to 2076. Yeah. Um, how, why, why is that important? And how have you built a foundation to last? You know, there, there, you know, there are always moments in your life that you, ne you never forget about. And I always, um, my father and I were having a uh, conversation about um, the next generation of the business. And, you know, I was telling him we needed, he needed to do some better uh, estate planning. And he really didn't want to take care of that. He, that, that, that he's, he's like, it's fine. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what's the plan? And he goes, you'll figure it out. I go, that's the plan? He goes, that's the plan. <laughs> and I go, okay. And I could put a plaque in my office where he and I, we weren't sitting down, we were standing up. And I can tell you where that happened. And there's another, um, I was in Japan, I was visiting Shimano and I went out to lunch with uh, Mr. Shimano and he took me to the, uh, he took me to the noodle restaurant. He loved the noodle restaurant because they had two SKUs, noodles and beer. Those were the only two things on the menu. And uh, we get towards the end of the meal and I asked him, I go, how long has the noodle house been here? And he said to me, he said, it's been under the same ownership for 600 years. I, I go, that's crazy. He goes, it's true. And on the way out, he introduced me to the owner. Who's standing next to the owner? His son. And uh, you would just see that the, that the noodle company could go on. But I think Trek is a special company. And I think I have um, an obligation that there's 4,000 families who depend on Trek. Who, and then there's a lot of families. There's a lot of retailers. There, the Kegels depend on Trek. There's a lot of people who depend on Trek. 
And so I view my job as um, building a company to last and not just last while I'm there, but last uh, far beyond that. So that's always been my focus. And do you want to talk about your leadership strategy and what you do with the senior level people at Trek to ensure that the company is in, in good hands? And it, it has gotten to such a level that everyone there at the top people essentially have their own business unit. And I think you do a really good job on, on yeah. that. So, I mean, I've said, I've said this, um, you know, a guy who's really influenced me is Jim Collins and I've read all his books and I've been a Jim Collins fan for the last 20 years. And, uh, we were sitting around, I don't know, two years ago and I was sitting there with Mark Jocelyn, the HR guy. And we were talking about having a founder's mentality, uh, we we're going to have a conference of all of our leaders, bring them all into Madison and who should we get to speak? And we had a great lineup and I go, God, it'd be, he said, it'd be great to have Jim Collins. And I go, well, we're never going to get Jim Collins. And he goes, yeah, we are. And I'm like, have at it tiger. And, and Jim Collins came to Trek and uh, he spoke um, in Madison and it was, it was a game changer for me. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to read his books. It's another thing to sit in the audience and hear the man. Um, but one of his big things is, you know, level five leadership. All great companies have exceptional leaders. And it's not just the guy at the top or the woman at the top. It's the units that make up the company. And one of the things we've effectively done is we used to look at Trek as one big blob. And today we look at Trek as 420 individual uh, business units. And, you know, I have two things that I view as my responsibility. One is I want to create level five leaders. And the second one is, is I want to have um, great plans for their sparkling minibus. And, you know, we call each one of those units a sparkling minibus, a small pocket of greatness. And, you know, Trek's success is not going to be Trek. It's going to be 425 leaders getting the job done day in and day out and making sure it's my responsibility to make sure they have a great plan. And it's my responsibility to coach them up to being level five leaders. And if at Trek, all we accomplish is making sure all of our leaders are level five leaders and every one of our businesses is a small pocket of greatness, a sparkling minibus, we're done. That's all that needs to happen. And so my focus in the business is on those two things. And can you touch on how you've created a culture at Trek that's enabled you to recruit top talent in the world to Waterloo, Wisconsin? <laughs> Well, you know, that's, that's a great question, but I, I think that goes back to my dad. It's, um, it's the culture. He really created the culture. And this is interesting. This goes back to the, this goes back to who he was as a person is he cared more about other people than he cared about himself. And his goal in business wasn't to make the most amount of money. His goal in business was to great, run a great business and share that success with as many people as he did. And, you know, he had an ESOP and he had an uh, employee stock ownership program back in the 70s. And, you know, that employee ownership program exists today at Trek. 25% of Trek is owned by the employees. And he had uh, profit sharing and 401ks. And that was long before, you know, people were profit sharing. And, you know, he really believed in taking care of employees. And we do a lot of things for our employees that nobody ever hears about. And I'll, I'll never forget one, Trek was losing money one year and we had a sales rep out in California and his wife had cancer and she was going to die. And she had been accepted into this experimental program, but it cost $200,000. And I told the big guy about that and he goes, done. It wasn't, I th I'll think about it and I'll get back to you tomorrow. It was just, yeah, we'll, we'll do that, done. And 
That's the way my parents both thought, and that's the way Trex run. But we do that, and I would say that's culture 1.0, what makes Trex special. Culture 2.0 is we had this guy, Mark Joslin, who joined Trek as the HR dude, I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe a little bit more. And he said, he said, we're going to create an awesome bus here. And so we do a lot of amazing things at Trek. The best mountain bike trails in the world are not in Colorado or in British Columbia. They're in Waterloo, Wisconsin. We bought a couple hundred acres across the street and the most amazing trails are at Trek. If you want to go to the best cafe, the best chef in the United States, go to Trek. We got the squirrel. He's uh, holding court there at the Trek cafe. And I mean, he, it's just the hospitality at the Trek cafe is, is off the charts. It's, it's amazing, but we do all these things. And one of the things we really focus on is how can we make Trek a great place to work? And we belong to a group called Great Places to Work and we measure Trek every year. We have a number and every year we chart that number on how, how good is Trek um, as a place to work. And every year we have plans to improve that. Yeah, and you, you and everyone over at Trek has done a great job building an amazing company, but what, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've made in your career and, and lessons learned from that? How much time do we have? 20 ish minutes, but yeah, okay. questions in the chat box that, that, that I think are not just people saying that you're better looking than me. I think there was only yeah. one. Well, let, let me lay down on the couch for a minute. <laughs> you know, I really believe um, that the biggest mistakes I've made have been people mistakes where I have let people stay in a job for too long and they were not doing the job that I needed to be done and they were not living by the values of the company and I tolerated it. And uh, that, that costs the company a lot in financial terms. It costs the company in cultural terms, and it really um, held us back. And the most important thing you need to do as a leader is you need to have the best team on the field. And that is a lesson that I've learned the hard way. I've paid for that lesson. Um, and I have, you know, I give all the people that, um, I work with directly, I give a Christmas gift to. And each year I give them a different Christmas gift. And so it always takes me a while to come up with, well, what am I going to give them this year? And this year I gave them a picture of us, our leadership team. And I had, um, I had a plaque put on it, um, best team on the field. That was it, best team on the field. 2020 done. And then on the, on the back of it, I did a handwritten note to each one of them telling them how much they meant to track and how much they meant to me and what they've done. And I'm just so proud of the group that's at track. Um, and it, you know, it just means a lot to me, but it's all about people. And if you take a look at my biggest mistakes, they've come down to people. And I want to go back to, to your dad, the big guy, my grandpa, Dick Burke, who founded Trek, passed away in 2008. You wrote a book about his life, legacy, your relationship with him. It's called One, One Great Thing. Can you talk about why you wrote the book and the top lessons that you learned from him? And then, then we'll move on to questions. You know, um, I almost cry when I, uh, when I think about him. And um, he meant a lot to me. And uh, I just go back and um, he was an amazing guy. And he died too early. And I learned so much from him. And I wanted my kids 
to understand the lessons of my father's life. And he gave an amazing speech at his 70th birthday. And <laughs> he asked me that night, he said, uh, I have a number of remarks I'd like to make this evening. And I said, well, okay, that's great, dad. He goes, uh, when should I give my remarks? And the, the only people who are there is the family. I'm like, well, dad, you can do that whenever you want. And about 20 minutes later, he's like, I really want to know when I can give my remarks. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not a sales meeting. You can, why, why don't we do it after dinner and before dessert? And he goes, okay, that would be fine. So we get to after dinner and before dessert and he stands up and out of his sport coat, he pulls out the yellow legal pad. And my father took copious notes for 50 years. And he had these binders where he kept all the notes and they were all on yellow, yellow legal pads. And he had six pages and he took the family through his whole life. And at the end, he said, I have one last great thing to do in my life. He goes, I don't know what it is, but I have one last great thing. And uh, I don't know, maybe six months later, he had a heart valve put in and it was infected and uh, he had an 84 day battle in the hospital and he didn't make it. But uh, in those 84 days, he, uh, the one last great thing he did was the, was the way he died and the love that he passed on. And uh, I wanted my kids to understand the lesson of his life. So after he gave that speech about his 70th birthday, I was flying to Europe. And it was such an amazing speech. I go, I'm going to type out all the notes, just what I remembered. And I kept it. And then I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to write a short little book for my two kids. And so I, I wrote the book and my assistant, um, she read it and she goes, this is really good. You should turn it into a book. And I had a couple other people read it. And so we turned it into a book. Um, and I thought it was uh, pretty good. So if anybody wants uh, that book, um, Rotary will give you my email and send me a note and I'll send you a copy of that book. Did, right. did you want to know, do we have time for, for his lessons? Yeah, fire away. I, I just if you got any off your head. I, I just a couple off off my, off my head. Um, you know that, that whole thing I already talked about it was the customer comes first. He was he was uh, he was great about he knew the customer made the decisions and he he was great about that. Um, I think one of his uh, biggest lessons was he played the infinite game and there's a book out now by Simon Sinek called The Infinite Game. If you read the first uh, two pages, that's the story of Trek. And that's what my father did. He wasn't in it for the quarterly results or the early financial statement. He was in it for The Infinite Game to build a great company. And he left that lesson. And, you know, the other lesson he left, and we've really adopted it at Trek, is there's a red barn at Trek where the company started. And it, to be honest with you, it's not a very good looking barn. And the marketing department once wanted to shoot an ad with, with my father in it. And so they took him to a good looking barn. And he said, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> he was an authentic guy. He goes, not doing it. And uh, so I don't think they did it. But his whole thing was, this was a guy who had the nickname, the big guy, and he was 5'8". And the reason he got that name, and I gave it to him, is he was, he was a big personality. But more importantly than that is he thought big. And when Trek was a small company, he always saw something much bigger. And when he took a look at Milwaukee, his foundation, you know, he was named Philanthropist of the Year in Milwaukee 10 years after he died. And it's because he always saw, he always could see bigger things. And, you know, he's left that lesson behind that track. And I think we've done, I think we've done a pretty good job of living up to that. So those are a few of the things that I think are good lessons for everyone. Absolutely. 
Um, let's go to questions. And Mary or Michelle, can you type in, I forget what time we have to go to, if it's 55 or what. So um, JV, we'll just go kind of rapid fire answers on these. Um, Teresa Regan, what percentage of your business is domestic and what are your biggest markets globally? We're going rapid fire. Uh, what percentage of the business is domestic? Probably 35%. Biggest markets overseas? Um, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, that's one business unit for Trek that's big. Um, the Netherlands is a big business unit for Trek. Um, we do well in Australia. Um, those are some big ones. Sounds good. And we have till 1258. So if people have more questions, feel free to drop them in. Um, Michael McNeil, with the explosion of stationary bike of the stationary bike market, like Peloton, Nordatrack getting into it, do you see them as a competitor or an enabler slash promoter for the sport? Promoter. I think, uh, you know, that if you would have asked me that a year and a half, two years ago, I would have, I wouldn't have been able to answer the question. Uh, today, I would say promoter people who are riding Pelotons or they get the joy of a bike inside in Milwaukee when it's 10 below. And I think they're really, they really want to get outside when the time is right. I, I think it's gotten a lot of people back into cycling. Uh, Pauli, Paula, Penny Baker, do you have anything to help drivers understand the need to respect cyclists as we're encouraged to respect motorcyclists or yeah, any, any way for drivers to respect cyclists on the road more? You know, one of my favorite products at Trek is I was in San Diego maybe seven or eight years ago and I saw, um, I saw a road cyclist in the middle of the day had a, had a light on, on the back of his bike. The problem was you couldn't see it. And I said to myself, well, God, that would be a great idea if you could see his blinking light because people just thought about lights for at night. And so we developed a product called the Flare R and it's this product that sits on the back of your bike that from a mile and a half away, you can see this amazing light. And I was with my wife driving the other day and we saw a car a mile and a half away and we saw this and she said, you know, I was driving in the car the other day and I was turning the radio and my head popped up and I could see a cyclist 500 yards away because he had that light. And I, um, I'm not trying to be a salesperson today, but if you're cycling, um, if you want to be visible to car drivers, go out, go over to Wheel and Sprocket and buy a set of lights. It makes a massive difference. All right. Um, Captain Jamie Reeve, I'll still answer your question. Um, with your customer service focus, do you also rally them to help with innovation and ideation? Oh, um, not as much as we should. Um, we're actually looking to put in a new system um, that will do a much better job of capturing things. One of the um, benefits of the pandemic has been Microsoft Teams, and I would say that our listening skills in the past 12 months have multiplied 5x. Um, I run an executive strategy meeting every Monday morning at nine o'clock that goes for three or four hours. We start out every one of those meetings with two customers. And when you get uh, your eight top executives in a room with two customers with their five pieces of advice for Trek, amazing things happen. So we do a really good job of listening. When you take a look at how well do we listen to customer service people, we have um, a big area of opportunity and improvement there. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Martinka, not a question, just says, thanks for being a great Wisconsin employer and for the many gifts the Families Burke Foundation has offered to its home state. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Kathy Burke on the call too. She does a lot with the foundation. I think she's on with Laney. Um, Tom Sattler. All, all, all of my sisters do, oh, and uh, I don't. <laughs> 
Tom, Tom Sattler, have you been able to compete as a manufacturer against global competition? How have you been able to compete as a manufacturer against global competition? Okay, that's a um, big uh, question. We're in a global marketplace and um, whether people like it or not. And we get a lot of uh, product from uh, Asia. We also import product from Europe. We, we have a large factory in Germany um, that makes bikes for the European market. It also makes e-bikes. And uh, we also build high-end bikes, um, expensive bikes in Wisconsin. But um, the entire supply chain for the bicycle business is in Asia. All the parts come from Asia. There aren't tire manufacturers, crank makers, cassette makers, chain makers in the United States, zero. So if you go to the automotive business, um, there's, a supply, there's a supply base. In the bicycle business, there really isn't. And you know, we were hit hard by the Trump tariffs. And one of my frustrations with the government is you know, if you wanted to have a proactive trade policy for bicycle manufacturing in the United States, you could do that, but nobody has the vision and nobody has the um, desire to sit down and actually deal with a real problem um, that could be solved. They do it in Europe and in the United States, nobody asks. It's a just sits there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We got three minutes and about four questions. So we'll move quick. Um, Karen Hong, what message would you give to peer CEOs and leaders about the future and how to leverage commerce to influence culture for good? Well, not really a rapid fire question. No, it's not, but. Um... Yeah, I, I would say this is um, I would read about companies who do it well and I would adopt those best practices. It's all out there. They're amazing companies, whether it's Trek, whether it's Patagonia. Um, there's a lot of companies who do amazing things and uh, you can learn from those companies. Yeah. You don't uh, need to rewrite uh, that chapter. Yeah. Can you comment on the e-bike boom? It's a big boom, that is in the second inning. And if you haven't ridden an e-bike, go ride an e-bike. It will change your life. There are two things in the last 15 years that have put a massive smile on people's faces, an iPhone and an e-bike. That's it. Uh -huh. There's no zero is the correct answer to the question of how many people have been disappointed buying an e-bike. Zero. Okay. Um, Jen Jenny says, I appreciate your efforts to get more people of color in the bike business from sales and management to maintenance. What are you doing to get more women in the industry? Oh, <laughs> you know, that's, we have, I'll tell you, we um, have a great group of women at Trek in some really uh, powerful positions. And um, our, um, hiring continues to increase in that area. One of the areas that we're hiring um, in certain cities is where we have retail stores. You need, we, we have this at track corporately is we have a great um, female sales, I mean, female workforce. I mean, it's off the charts and, and you need that base at entry level positions to get the knowledge to work up in the organizations. One of the great things about Trek is we promote from within. And, you know, you know the woman who's in charge of design at Trek is Beth Silkey for retail design. She's off the charts. Lori Cook's in charge of global customer service. Amazing. Maureen Muldoon, legend at Trek. She's been there for over 30 years. And so is Lori. Maureen's in charge of rest of the world sales. Um, our general counsel at Trek, Jen Nager, I'm on the phone with her to talk about a problem in 30 minutes. Um, we do a really good job in that area and we're continuing to do so. All right, I think we are out of time. That's great, well, uh, thank, thank, you very, thank you very much for having me.
Uh, John, Richie, uh, really appreciate this deep and insightful look into Trek, the industry, your philanthropic efforts. Um, really can't say thank you enough for all you do for your employees, your customers, our communities, and the state of Wisconsin. Um, in honor of leaders like yourselves who speak to our club, we'll be donating to the YWCA Southeast Wisconsin, whose mission is eliminating racism, empowering women, promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. Thank you both for, for being with us today. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Thank um, you. Again, welcome to the club, Amelia. Uh, happy to have you with us today uh, and for helping with the introduction. Look forward to getting together in person. Next Tuesday, uh, join us to welcome Jason Stein, director, uh, research director with the Wisconsin Policy Forum, who will talk about the recent report on financial and programmatic challenges facing the UW system budget. To close the program today, Michelle will be ending with our Rotary More Now Than Ever video series featuring Wendell Willis. Again, thank you all for joining us today. Our program is adjourned. You know, I'll, I'll use a, uh, a kind of tried but true uh, piece, like what is your why? You know, you look at Simon Sinek, talks about it a lot. You know, I think Rotary speaks to my why. And if it's not part of your why, then all in fairness, probably you shouldn't be a member. But if it does speak to your why, I think at your core, then you deserve it to yourself and your community. It's gonna make you a better person. You're gonna be better for helping the community out. So why not continue to be a member, but also it's service before self. I I've watched over the years, right? People that think, you know, I'm gonna get rich off of rotary connections or networking. This is not the opportunity for that. This is to kind of roll up your sleeves and show your worth uh, if you really want to make the community better. So yeah, I think for me, my better friendships have come through Rotary. Uh, my better opportunities to both advance my organization or myself have come because I've made deposits and we've made the community better. And I think that's, you know, at the end of the day, right, uh, we all will push up daisies the exact same way but what do you want to be known for and what do you want your legacy to be? Mm -hmm.